Well, good morning. So, I don't know if you guys even know this, but about 38 years ago, 17 lay people met together and said, we want to have a church in far northwest Austin, back when there was no 35, or, uh, uh, 183 overpasses, back when this was just like mostly cattle pastures out here, and when the Leanderthals still existed, <laughs> and the cedar choppers still existed back in those days, and they started an adventure of faith. And what an adventure it has been. God has used you and them and this church in mighty ways to move the kingdom of Jesus Christ in greater Austin forward, and God is still moving in incredible ways. So, we started a journey in October, our next adventure in faith, where we started looking for our next lead pastor. After over 10 years of the elders praying and thinking and asking God and making moves to, to see this come to pass, we felt like the time was right to start in full, and we asked you all to pray, you all jumped in and started praying, and then we started interviewing candidates from all over the na nation asking the question, God, who have you already picked out? Help us find that person. And sure enough, we found that person. And so, after months of interviewing, conversation after conversation, us going to visit them and them coming to visit us, and then we brought our candidate to you, the congregation, and we had a 98% vote affirming that our next lead pastor of Hill Country Bible Church is Tim Cool. And for the past six months, Tim and Wendy and their kids have moved in, kind of gotten settled. We started the whole process of helping him understand all the details of who Hill Country Bible Church is and what we've been and what we could do going forward. And in those conversations, it was so interesting because literally Tim and I spent hours and hours and hours together talking, and there was never a time in all that time where he went, y'all think what? Y'all believe what? Y'all want to see what happened? There was never a moment, in fact, at every conversation, Tim not only engaged, but he also added vision and direction and thoughtfulness. And we have found a godly, gifted, passionate leader. And today's the day when I have the privilege of calling him my pastor. So today we make the big baton handoff. Tim Cool, come on up. I am so excited that you're here and so optimistic about the future of Hill Country. Thank you, brother. God brought the right man at the right time to this place, and I want to pray a prayer over you. I'll take it. Father in heaven, you are a great and mighty God. You're the God who knows the end from the beginning. You lay all things out in your great purpose. And Father, you are the loving God who sent your son Jesus into the world to be an atonement for our sins. And you've given us the church guided by your Holy Spirit. And you've planted Hill Country Bible Church for a purpose. And now you're bringing Tim Cool to step into the leadership of this church. Father, I pray that you would fill him with your incredible wisdom. Lord Jesus, would you overwhelm him with the love that you have for people? And Holy Spirit, would you speak to him each and every day, giving him clarity and guidance as he is now the spiritual leader of this church, functioning under the headship of Jesus Christ, and may be this be a wonderful 
just incredible time for he and his family as they minister and love and get to know and see this city reached with the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, may you put your anointing upon him as we support him in every way. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Bless Thank you, brother. You. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever gotten on stage after the morning call to the day historic. It's, it's not my particular favorite. <laughs> I will admit, though, that my right shoulder feels like it's 130 years old, and so maybe that's the historic part of the day. It's not lost on me that there are some people that should take priority over me today. Uh, and the first set is Tim and Cindy Hawks. I, I, my goal is to be here for the next 20 years. And Tim and Cindy have invested 35 years of their adult life into this church. So if I nail my long-term goal, Tim still lapped me, (laughs) y'all. And so could we do this? I know I'd be awkward at the locations, Lander and Steiner, but can we thank and appreciate 35 years? Absolutely find your feet. You can't, you can't see over at Steiner or Leander, but Tim Hawks is over in the corner not enjoying that at all. <laughs> He's really not going to like the next slide then. With all my newfound power, <laughs> I'd like to point our direction. In light of 35 years of service, we'd like to kick off 35 days of appreciation for the Hawks. On October 8th, you can be excited in your heart, but right now we're going we're gonna to move with some details. Starting on October 8th, we're going to give you a couple of things to do, culminating in a day that you don't want to miss. The first thing that we're going to do is give you an opportunity to write notes of gratitude and appreciation. Uh, And I'm just going to let your soul deal with that however you want to. Tim Hawks does not really like to be affirmed and appreciated, so I'm excited this is going to make him uncomfortable. (laughs) We're going to give you guys four different weekends at all of our locations where we're going to furnish and produce different uh, notes so that you can take those home and then drop them off right back here. And then for 13 days in a row from this stage, we're going to read them aloud. No, we won't. We're going to send them home. (laughs) We're going to send them home with Tim and Cindy so that they realize that 35 years were invested well. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to open up a fund on our church website that you can give to. Because if you know anything about Tim and Cindy Hawks, even though they're handing over leadership here, they are not done with ministry, not by a long shot. Tim has been engaged with a number of national, and this sounds very James Bondy, but it is true, and international organizations where he and Cindy are both trying to determine where the next season of ministry is going to take them. But almost certainly, it's going to have them traveling and investing in other leaders, and investing in young leaders, and investing in other major cities and ministries around this world. And so we would like to launch them into that stage of ministry with a gift so that Tim and Cindy Hawks can continue to advance the gospel. The third thing that we're going to do is a celebration Sunday. Y'all, Tim Hawks is not done preaching here. Come on now. I would like a weekend off, and I'd like it soon. (laughs) And so Sunday, November 12th, We're going to appreciate them. We're going to have Tim return back to the pulpit. And we'd like you that weekend to bring your friends and your family and your neighbors and your relatives and your enemies, I believe you said last weekend. And we'd like you guys to be here with us as we appreciate them. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, let's close in prayer today, guys. (laughs) No. The second person that I am honestly so much more aware of than me in this moment. And I, you know, this is either going to sound trite or it's going to sound like the exact right thing, is the person of Jesus. We've been in a series in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus sat down with the people in first century Israel slash Rome and he began to teach them about the kingdom. 
and about how everything in their world had devolved down to this kind of poor facsimile of what God wanted for them, during the Sermon on the Mount, he shoots the picture so much higher. And I'm actually really excited to just fold into the direction we're already going because more important than me is to appreciate Tim and Cindy, and more important than them is to prioritize the person of Jesus. And so if you've got a Bible, why don't you open it up to Matthew chapter 5. We're starting our second phase of the Sermon on the Mount as we begin to look at elevating your character. We've already taken a look at the opening chunk, the Beatitudes, and now we're going to walk into a section where Jesus starts to challenge how the kingdom character should start to impact who we are. I'm going to read this chunk to you, and then we're going to work through it. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a yoda, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. A lot of us at Hill Country Bible Church have been church folk for a long time. This passage is comforting to you. It's familiar to you. It's like brisket queso. It just feels right. But if you're not a regular part of a long-standing Bible teaching church, there's actually some challenging ideas right here in this paragraph that you might not notice. Let me highlight some things for you. Jesus begins by affirming the Jewish law. Well, now that's interesting because we believe that Jesus fulfilled the law and then introduces an era of grace through which by his propitiation, his atonement, he redeems us and we just confess his righteousness, we confess our sin, we believe in his person and work, and thereby we are saved by grace. But he starts off really going hard on Judaism, doesn't he? Well, and then he says, verse 18, man, nothing is going to pass away until everything from the law is accomplished. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, you can be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a second. Hold on a second. That doesn't sound very grace-filled. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, shoot. I better try harder to be betterer. And then verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait a, wait a second, you, are we just, do I need to start trying again? Do I need to get out my Old Testament law? Jesus, what pressure are you putting? What direction are you pushing? And over the course of our time together, we're just going to float some of these phrases to the surface. And we'll handle them one by one. And by the end of the morning today, my hope is that you have a, like a nice, redemptive sixth sense moment. And if you don't know what the sixth, sixth sense, you're in trouble because I'm going to ruin a movie for you today, okay? <laughs> Let's do this. Right off the bat, in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Not an iota, not a dot will pass until everything in the law is accomplished. Jesus does something very interesting right off the bat. He says the law and the prophets. Now, if you are a history buff, you know that the law was with Moses during the period of the Egyptians. Egyptians, the world's first great superpower. By the time you get to the prophets, we've already got an Assyrian exile, we've got a Babylonian exile, and we've got a Persian return to the land. So when Jesus invokes law and prophets, it's a chunk of scripture, yes, but it's also a long view of Jewish history, isn't it? And I'm telling you right now, you don't think about periods of history without having some sort of an emotional attachment to it. Um, if, if I talked about the time period when our oldest, who is now a senior in college, I remember walking him to his first day of kindergarten. I mean, I don't know if you remember walking your first, but that was like a special day for us. If I mentioned the Reagan administration, some of you will go right back to a period of time, huh? And I chose it intentionally because Ronald Reagan was governor of what? California, y'all. 
If I mention the Obama administration, you have another emotional reaction. We don't have reactions to periods of time without feeling something about it. And Jesus is doing something on purpose when he references the law and the prophets. There is a lot in just that reference. But really all we need to know right now is that they would have had a reaction to that period of time. Because they would have been in their fields. The period of Moses and the law, oh my gosh, that's 4th of July stuff, y'all. That's Declaration of Independence stuff. We are a nation. We are chosen by God. We are liberated by God. And now we are governed by God. We are free. We are special. We are redeemed. Moses, the law, oh, that's pride. The prophets? At this point in time, we look backwards across the prophets and we see, whoa, in all of their brokenness, God kept promising the Messiah. God kept promising Jesus. God kept promising Jeremiah chapter 31. A time is coming, the Lord says, when I will have set up a new covenant with them. I will write it on their hearts, not on stone. I will be their God and they will be my people. We see the prophets as this beautiful articulation that in the midst of absolute brokenness, Jesus is promised and he fulfills so many little random promises that overwhelm us with God's sovereign plan. But if you're a first century Jew living under Roman rule, the period of the prophets were challenging. There was a lot of chastening coming through the prophets. And in the prophets, it was a reminder that they weren't living right. So as Jesus introduces this, I just want you to know that there's already some emotional weight with what he's doing with God's calling and with Jewish history. All right? Now, let's keep moving forward. He adds some other elements to this. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from law until all is accomplished. So he's not just looking at a long view of God's redemptive history and their failure to meet it, but he's actually reaffirming that, by the way, even though God's standard is why you failed, I'm not here to back off of God's standard. Who? <sighs> You go to a doctor's visit, and the first thing they have you do is stand on a scale. How rude is that? Like, listen, I got three kids and a mortgage, okay? Sometimes I drive through Popeyes, and I know that I've got more weight on my frame than I should. And then after they take your weight, they ask you questions. What's your level of activity? How much alcohol do you drink in a week? <laughs> do you doom scroll on your phone? And it's almost like the doctor knows you're not healthy, and pushes right into it. It's very frustrating, y'all. <laughs> Jesus introduces the concept of frustration by referencing the period from the law to the prophets, and then he has all these phrases where he's not backing off of what God's call to them was. There is not an inkling of hesitation, of doubt, of insecurity on Jesus' part about what the standard was. Uh, if you have been a parent you know that there is no sense in arguing with a three-year-old, right? Like three-year-olds just don't think. They're barely out of the stage where their body weight is 80% head, so they've just, <laughs> they've just mastered the art of walking, and all of a sudden the will starts to come out in them, and they'll say something ridiculous to you, like, I'm never going to bed again. And you're like, this doesn't even make physical sense. And then you'll just gently, in the authority of a parent, you'll say something back to them because you've read the New Testament. You know what God's calling is to you as a parent. You're going to instruct and raise your child. And then your three-year-old just doubles down on the fact that they've, in fact, never slept. And they'll never sleep again. You're like, this is, whose child? Woman, your child. It makes no sense. And so then you instruct your child again. And then your three-year-old just starts to just go off. And it just brings out something special in you, doesn't it? <laughs> you know that you shouldn't argue with a three-year-old, that it makes no sense. But I've had friends, not me, but I've had friends who've chosen to engage in arguing with three-year-olds. Car rides, in my context, at Disneyland is a great place to get in an argument with a three-year-old. And then life kind of settles back in, and you move forward, and then you have a 13-year-old. Whew. Man, do you miss the days of the three-year-olds when you were at least physically larger than them. 
you should also never argue with a 13-year-old. But my dumb self, y'all, I got four kids. I've had four chances to learn this lesson. (sighs) And in us, when we speak to our three-year-old or when we speak to our 13-year-old and we set a standard and then the three-year-old or the 13-year-old doesn't want to meet our standard, it pulls out of me things that I'm often not proud of or it does in me this. I decide I'm either going to yell at them, and I'm sorry, you just learned your new pastor has once upon a time yelled at his children. It happened once. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> or what it does in me is it pulls me to lower my standard, right? It does something in me when there's pushback. I either start to yell or I lower my standard. And I want you to see in this, as we move through the passage, you're going to feel something about all the language Jesus has about maintaining a high standard. As he's talking about this, there's some tummy trouble that they're having listening to this high call because Moses freed them and the prophets reminded them that they were captive. And Jesus says, hey, by the way, all of that still stands. And he's not an out-of-control yelling father, and he's also not decided to back off of what his standard was. He's consistent. Our God is consistent. All right? So let's continue to move. The next phrase that we're going to take a look at is just verse 19. And it's hard for me to read sideways, so I'm going to read it here. Do not, excuse me, yeah, do not think that I have come... Um, uh, to, nope, relax one of the, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All right, so there's two concepts that Jesus introduced that doesn't make sense to our brains, okay? Because y'all have been taught good Bible. Y'all have been taught good theology. And it's almost like, Jesus, what do you mean that we relax a least commandment? We don't relax your commands. You're God and we're not. We obey your commands. And what does it mean that there's a least important command? All of God's word matters. So what's going on there? Well, Jesus acknowledges that after centuries and centuries and centuries of trying, two things had happened. One, the people decided that if they were not going to obey everything God commanded, that they wanted him to back off. So what they did is they invented two things that they do that we do as well. They relaxed the calling of God. Now, how do we relax the calling of God? Well, it's very simple. God says what he means, and then we decide what it means to us. I'll say that again for the people in the back. God says what he means, and then we decide what it means for us. Now, you're arguing with me in your heart. Guys, this is our first date together. We got to be on the same page. You're like, no, 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 pastor. I don't think you know Hill Country Bible. Like, When God says it, we believe it and we do it, amen. (laughs) Do you want me to mess with y'all or do you not? I don't know. Let's not mess with you. Let's just talk about other people, other Christians in other churches, okay? (laughs) I'm aware of Christians that are very aware that God calls them to give. And they decide what that means to them. They decide what they'll give based on what they think their church needs which is a fascinating way to interpret God's call on your life to trust him with your finances. Well, I go to a big church and they obviously don't need anything. You're right, we don't. God's calling is for you to trust him with your finance. If you give less, we have to do less and that would be wonderful. But we decide what we give based on what we think our church needs. Sometimes we give based on what we think our church deserves. If you're mad at the pastor, ooh, you're gonna give less. Cool, you've decided what you think God means to you. Sometimes we make decisions on what we give based on, oh, I don't know, to boat or not to boat. That is the question, you know, whether it is nobler in the mind to get a trailer and an outboard motor or not. Sometimes we give based on whether or not it's time for the kids to head off to A&M or not. Sometimes we give based on whether or not the economy looks like it's going to do well or not to do well. My point is this, when Jesus says, whoever relaxes, how on earth would someone relax what God said? Yo, people do it all the time. And again, these are other Christians, not us, but other other people do relax what the calling of God is on their life. 
And then what's interesting about that is as soon as you relax the calling of God on your life, you probably relax sin in your life as well. Because you would never call any of those justifications or interpretations of the calling to give, you would never call that greed. You just wouldn't. You'd call it shrewdness. You'd call it maturity. You'd call it, you know, I need to strategize my giving plan. And you wouldn't wrestle with the fact that what God wants to do in your heart through the habit and calling of giving is eradicate greed so that you're selfless with your spouse, so that you're selfless with your kids, so that you pour out your life for the people on your frank list, so that through you, Jesus is demonstrated all the way backwards to this calling he gave on your life. But I don't want to get too pushy today. It's day one. Let's back off. What would it possibly mean that there's a least of the commandments? All of God's word is infallible, inspired, and true. We believe in the verbal and plenary inspiration of the word of God. Tim, how could Jesus even say that there is a least commandment? Well, let me tell you this. I prefer to pray more than I prefer to fast and pray, right? I mean, obviously, this is the body of a drive through specialist. Um, I prefer to rejoice with those who rejoice more than I prefer to weep with those who weep. And so it's not that Jesus is saying that some commandments aren't true. He's not saying that some commandments have authority and some aren't. He's just acknowledging what is true, that some things are more compelling and easier for us to enter into in terms of obedience than other things. There are some things in my life that are very easy for me to pursue in my walk with God, and there are some things in my life which are hard. And I wish it wasn't true. I wish I just dominated on the offensive and defensive end of the field. But y'all, there are some things in that book which I am so elevated and motivated by, and there are some things in that book that challenge me and are hard. And Jesus just acknowledges that in light of that, there was a generation that decided to relax some of those things and interpret some of those things and turn down the volume on some of those things. And so Jesus is saying that we relax the least commandments when we disagree with the standard he has for us. It's just like the Garden of Eden all over again. Did God really say, right? I learned something pretty cool two and a half weeks ago. Um, I'm learning so much my time as a Texan. Uh, but this has actually nothing to do with Texas. I learned that there is something that a dad invented, which sounds like the most dad invention ever. There is an eight-foot rim basketball league. And you're like, well, I don't even understand. What are you talking about? Well, there are a bunch of guys in this world who, again, are built like this with a drive through bod. And drive through bods love watching sports. And we love all the things that they can do. And we can't do many slash any of them. Guys, sometimes sleeping wrong will hurt my neck for two days. And so this dad decided he was going to start playing basketball with his buddies, I don't know, at a junior high play, I, I, like a place where you could lower the rim. He, they started playing basketball on eight-foot rims because they could dunk on eight-foot rims. And I'm watching clips of these guys dunk on rims, and I'm so confused because they look like me, but they're doing things that I've never seen myself do. And then I read the caption, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there is a dad league of basketball. Were you allowed to dunk on an eight-foot rim? And my immediate thought was, that looks fun. My second thought was, that doesn't count. And I had an embarrassing third thought. The once upon a time, I was at my friend's house in California, and he had a six-foot rim for his kids. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Guys, that is, that is six feet. I am barely, I had to fold my legs so hard to make it look <laughs> like I was above the ground. That is enough of that. That is, boom, boom, okay, whew. Here's the thing. You learn two things from this. One, anything looks majestic if it's in slow motion. <laughs> and number two, how much temptation is it for us to just lower God's calling on our life and say that that's what the standard is. And it's like, man, Tim, we go to a high conviction church. This is not where you're like, I know there are other people like that. And man, there are these movements in Christianity today that are frustrating. And so guys, let's talk about the fact that deconstructionism, oh, I need to be so careful in how I talk about this. Deconstructionism is a movement whereby people see things in Christians that they don't see in Christ, and therefore they walk away from Christ because what they've seen in Christians. 
There's some truth to that. There's some responsibility that I have towards my kids because my kids trust what they see at home more than what they're going to see on this stage. And so I'm on board with the responsibility of living my faith. But if you're watching online and you haven't been in church for a while because you've been hurt by someone else, can I please say so humbly and so gently, two things, I need to take ownership of my walk. But you're walking away from Jesus because of what you see in other believers. And I I think that's lowering the standard of what he's called you to. He's called you to himself. And I just want to be so humble about that because there might have something have happened in your life that is legitimately hard. I would just say, could you please return to Jesus? And there's also a movement, y'all. And I know it's not us. I know it. And, And I don't mean that tritely. But man, there is just this depth of anger in our country that if we just make it conservative enough, it'll be righteous. Conservative isn't righteous. Or if we make it liberal enough, it'll be compassionate. It's not compassionate. The person of Jesus is righteous and compassionate. And so, like, those are just eight-foot leagues, y'all. That's not Duncan, okay? Jesus is the standard. We need to keep moving. Okay, good point. Thank you for that. All right. So, Jesus moves on. And he says down here in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter. He's like, well, wait a second. You just said, hey, if we kind of water down some of the easier things in the law, but now you're saying, no, as a matter of fact, unless you're higher than, unless you're more than, unless you're greater than, you're not going to get into the kingdom at all. And it's like, huh, what is going on? I did some work for you in the last couple of weeks, and I looked up a phrase right here. Cameras, I'm so sorry. I'm going to step in front of the TV. Right here, it says, your righteousness exceeds. That's, he's cooking in your kitchen right now. I looked up what that means, and it was real unfortunate. It means unless your righteousness is more than, it's, unless your righteousness exceeds. Guys, it means what it says. I don't know what to tell you other than, There's no special work in the Greek that needs to be done here. Your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes. Now, if you're a church person, you're real familiar with the term Pharisees and scribes. But if you're not, let me explain to you what happened. The prophets ended during the Persian Empire, right? You know this. You're so good at this. And they moved back to the land. Matter of fact, Cyrus, Karush, helps fund rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Guys, this is real world history. And then the Bible kind of goes silent on what happens. Well, I'll tell you what happens. Eventually, a young man named Alex overthrows the Persians. And Alex conquers the world. And Jerusalem is occupied by Greek rule. They're not in charge of themselves. And then after Alexander dies, his kingdom splits into fourths. And the Ptolemies mostly had control over the area that Israel was in. And they tried to revolt and rebel because there was like this broken kingdom, but the revolt and the rebellion didn't really stick. And doggone it, the Romans are right around the corner. And hey, hey, ladies, ask your husbands if they think about the Roman Empire a couple times a week, right? They do. The Romans are right around the corner. And in light of all of this, this movement got started in Israel called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are watching all of these things happen. And the Pharisees, watch this. They didn't believe in the power of Rome. They didn't believe in the power of Greece. They didn't believe in the power of Persia. They decided, you know what? This is on us. If we return back to the high calling of God, God will restore our independence. And so the Pharisees looked at everything that the law called them to do, and they're like, well, we're not doing it, so we should have more things to do. And the Pharisees added a bunch of rules that helped you keep the rules, okay? Let me say that back to you. They added some rules to help you keep the rules. And so when Jesus says, your righteousness has to exceed the scribes and Pharisees, everyone's thinking, wait a second, we had to even invent the Pharisees to get back on track to begin with. And you're saying that's not enough? On top of the more, more? This is a heavy weight to bear. And right here, as a pastor, I could get all hot and bothered and yell about your righteousness and this and that. It's just that I live in a culture that defines conviction through the expression of anger. And if I'm angry enough at the people I think who are dumb 
-er than me. That's how I demonstrate conviction. And so I kind of want to back off anger right now and say this phrase right here, your righteousness exceeding, needs to be handled well. Because my culture defines conviction as anger at someone else. And Jesus says, no, 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 your righteousness exceeds. This is not a weapon for you to throw at someone else. This is the weight that needs to set on you. So let's talk about a depth of conviction rather than a breadth of rules. I care about paint colors. Obviously, I'm artsy. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, Tim, I didn't know you had a background in construction or art history. I have neither. I have 27 years of background with Wendy Renee Cool. My wife loves pretty things. She's a pretty lady. And she loves decorating. She loves interior design. And over the years, I've learned, did you know that it's hard to really find gray, like legitimate gray? Did you know that most grays lean purple or green or even brown? And so I'm so judgy now when I walk into a doctor's office, I'm like, that's not gray, it's purple. That's not gray, it's green. Because of my years spent with my wife, and here's the cool thing about my wife. My wife has never once told me, hey, babe, I like paint colors. I need you to as well. I just love my wife. And after 27 years of being with Wendy, it's hard to figure out where Tim stops and Wendy begins anymore, right? Like, I have an affection for that because I have an affection for her. I pay attention to that because I pay attention to her. And when Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, this group right here decided, ah, God, we're not cutting it, so hold on. We'll be back in a minute. We're going to figure out some things to do. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Yield to him. Be affectionate for him. Let him own more space of your heart, a depth of righteousness, not a breadth of rules. Oh my gosh, what Jesus is preaching here is actually not challenging. It's a gentle, clear, consistent call to return back to the heart of God. Not to think that you've got to add more behaviors to your life so that you're more betterer than everybody else. Your righteousness is an affection for the call of God. So let's move back through the whole passage and see where we're going to end here. So right here... We talked through that. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a iota, not a dot will pass from all until the law is accomplished. Guys, the weight on you is the weight on all of us. Jesus spoke to a culture that felt so defeated that they had lost it. And that they were too far behind and they were going to catch up on their own. And it's fascinating to me that we read a passage like this and I'm tempted to tell you guys, well, let's do this and let's be that and let's rise to the occasion here. And it's the sixth sense. Nate Bargetsy is a comedian. Super clean. Super clean. Makes Jim Gaffigan look absolutely dirty compared to other comedians. Nate bargetsy has got a joke about the sixth sense. He said, it's crazy to me that as I watch the sixth sense, and again, if you've never seen it, Guys, it's like 35 years old. You should have seen it by now. It made more sense to me that Bruce Willis and his wife just weren't talking than that it made sense that Bruce Willis died in the opening scene when he was shot point blank. <laughs> he said, it made more sense to me that I saw relationship difficulty than what was right in front of me. And when we read this passage... How easy is it for us to see how we better try harder and a new pastor's here, I better be better and it's a new day and age, I better be more matter and it's a new day and age and I better be betterer and more and all of that. And right there Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill them. The passage wants to set a weight on you that is clear enough that you set your weight down because Jesus is sufficient. Right in the beginning of the movie, he said, I've come to fulfill them. I, I'm going to do all of it. I'm going to do the law, everything it commanded you to. The prophets were about your brokenness, but they were also about me. The law and the prophets is me. Hey, Pharisees, you're trying to add more. I want more depth with people. And so, ladies and gentlemen of Hill Country, today I tell you this. That in my first weekend here, I want to be obsessed with this man right here. Because Jesus is your righteousness. 
He is your sufficiency. Jesus has accomplished all for us. And I, yeah, you know what? I'm a little bit worried about today because it's weird, y'all. But I tell you what I'm not worried about. The next 20 years of Christianity in America, because the next 20 years of Christianity in America is not handed over to us to add more rules. This will not be the age of the scribes and the Pharisees. This will be the age of the sufficiency of Jesus. And so the bottom line today is simply this. At Leander, at Steiner, at Lakeline, it's this. That if you feel the weight and the pressure to always try harder, to be better, can you yield your sufficiency to Jesus? Can you yield your righteousness to Jesus? Because when you get this right, Pastor Jim started us off the first week. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There is an attitude and approach that if I'm choosing to make Jesus my righteousness, then the habits of giving or prayer or confession or or witnessing or or my long-term discipleship, all of these things engage my heart to him. And just like my 27 years with my wife, oh man, y'all, what if we gave Jesus sufficiency our next 20 years? (laughs) Mm, Let's pray. Jesus, I confess Lord, the strangeness I feel stepping onto a stage when I'm an ingredient in the mix, when I would prefer to not be an ingredient at all. Jesus, you started off this passage by saying that you will fulfill the law and that everything you'll put on your shoulders, the period of Moses and the Egyptians, the period of the prophets and the exiles, period of the Pharisees and the Romans, all of my failings, all of my life, you put on your shoulders, you take it to the cross, and you pay for it all. So Jesus, I pray for myself and for this church. Lord, call us to be preoccupied with your sufficiency. Lord, I pray that you would call us to always sit ourselves down and pick you up. And Jesus, in this way, our future is secure. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen.